Duly Noted, a health and care podcast, is the official podcast series of Duly Health and Care. Each podcast features physicians or team members discussing groundbreaking topics and innovations that help listeners reimagine and better understand an extraordinary health and care experience. In honor of Men's Health Month in June, we're continuing our conversation about men's health. So we're discussing the importance of men discussing their mental well-being and getting the right treatment for it. Our guest, Dr. Stephen Prince. He's a psychiatrist and department chair of behavioral and mental health for Dooley Health and Care. This is Dooley Noted, a health and care podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Joey Wallen. Hi, Dr. Prince. Thanks for joining us. Hi, Joey. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Sure. Great to have you. So first, a Cleveland Clinic survey says just over half of men say their health isn't something they talk about. Now, from a mental health perspective, from your own experience, why do you suppose that is? I think we have to take a look at several different factors. And one is really to take a look at traditional views in our society about men and masculinity. And so men, for instance, are supposed to be strong, should be self-reliant, do not need to seek out health care or care in general. We also need to take a look at that men, because of this, will often seek out health care when it's actually very extreme, when they have severe symptoms. So they don't go for preventative kind of care. And then men are often feeling very vulnerable when they go for a physical exam. So, you know, a typical physical exam For a male uh, adult involves having a rectal exam, involves having a hernia exam where their private parts are touched, and men feel very uncomfortable and vulnerable in this regard, so they often will not seek out care. Gotcha. So in recent years, it seems to me, whether it's because of social media or whatever else may be at work, there is more conversation publicly about mental health, the importance of talking about your own, of seeking out treatment for it if needed, maybe even just talking to someone that's not a professional to let someone know how you're feeling. Do you think that's getting better in society recently? I really do. I think that our culture is changing, even though there's still tremendous stigma about mental health, both for men and women, more for men than women. But I do think it's changing in a positive direction, which is very good. I think there's differences, which we'll talk about in a little bit, between men and women with mental health issues. And because of that, sometimes like depression may present differently for a man where they're more fatigued, more irritable, and that doesn't look like depression, what we think of typical depression. And so that somewhat prevents men from getting mental health as well. I still think that it's improving, like you said, but there's still the stigma, there's still social norms that say men should be strong and not talk about issues as much. They downplay symptoms more than women would do. And, you know, just these different triggers in our society for men versus women, men often, again, responding to more social expectations, gender role ideas. I was doing some research. I mean, I love this statement, and it says, Men who understand that there's no shame in improving their health and have the mindset that the real shame is having a need for mental health, having access and choosing to not engage in getting help, we must recognize the importance of positive mental health. So really, the mental health is so much more available. There's still the stigma, but absolutely getting better. What helps a lot is when we have men that have high profiles that publicly announce that they had depression or that they're out there getting mental health. And so, for instance, like having a Michael Phelps say that he had mental health issues and it's okay to seek out treatment, that really helps men in our society seek out care. And actually, it so happens that just before beginning our conversation, I was reading a story that broke in the news about Nick Kyrgios, one of the top men's tennis players in the world, mentioning in an interview that back in 2019, when he lost at Wimbledon, he was so distraught that he considered suicide before eventually seeking out treatment. So to your point, 
it can happen to anyone. So having said all the above, how important to men's health and well-being is just normalizing that conversation, having men be more comfortable with sharing those feelings? Yeah, so important. If we could normalize that it's acceptable to get physical exams and part of the physical exam is to be screened for mental health, right? So, so many men, if they're going to get mental health, it's actually a few factors. One is that we often see family members pushing men to get health. Here's where women are smarter and stronger than men. They seek out care more readily, but we also know that a strong woman in someone's life, whether that be a mother or a sister or a wife, often will push the important men in their life to seek out care. And the more that that happens, it's going to be wonderful that will normalize you know, mental health care. I also think training like our primary care physicians, which they do a very nice job, but they have some screening tools, some simple screening tools that assess for mental health. And that's becoming more routine and part of physical exams. And that will lead to a man getting further mental health care that they so deserve. And just as you said, I mean, just you reading that article, it's so interesting when we have really public figures expressing different components of illness. I remember when Ronald Reagan was giving a speech, a national speech, and he played around with his little ear device in his ear to be able to hear more effectively. All of a sudden, the hearing business boomed in success because it was acceptable. A man could say, I could get assessed for hearing loss. And so I think we need to look at that as well. So it's very important. You mentioned something really important too. Suicide is one of the leading causes of death in young men. And if we could get young men screened routinely for physical health issues, and then we could screen them for mental health issues. We're going to really help with mental health greatly. We know that the quicker we could get mental health treatment, the better the prognosis. And so very important to normalize this. So let me pick up on what you just mentioned there, mental health screenings. I think it's safe to say, doctor, that when we think of health screenings nowadays, we still think more of mainly the physical, not the mental. Yes. So when should that be done? How often? And what does that entail? If someone is getting a mental health screening, what's going to happen? Yeah. So mental health screenings really should occur at every visit to a primary care physician. So pediatricians should be screening, primary care docs should be screening. And there's Again, some tools right now that are really very simple. There's primary care docs use something called a PHQ 2 or 3, which asks just some basic questions about depression. And if someone has an elevated score, then they should be referred to a mental health specialist. I think families need to talk about this more frequently and do just check-ins with their family members and children. And if anyone is noticing any significant change in sleep patterns and energy patterns and grades dropping and difficulty with concentration, all of a sudden withdrawing and isolating more from family and friends, these are concerns that say, hey, Maybe we should screen a little bit more thoroughly, whether that's through a primary care physician initially and then refer to a, a behavioral health specialist. Dooley has a behavioral health specialty team. The majority of referrals really come through our primary care docs. I would encourage anyone in the Dooley system or outside the Dooley system, talk to ministry people, talk to teachers who are trained now more in mental health, talk to your doctor. We'll give out some numbers. There's some services that are available that someone could call and seek out some assistance to get referrals in your local community. So it should be screened routinely, at least on physical exams and talked about in schools and church and with family. So we've touched on the difference between men and women with regard to all this, but to follow up on that, can men and women have different symptoms for the same mental illness? And in a nutshell, how do we distinguish between the two? 
Yeah, men and women absolutely could have different symptoms. And so I think one thing to look at is that sometimes like the symptoms of depression or anxiety in a man is masked by unhealthy coping behavior. So men, for instance, when they get depressed, they'll go into some escapist behavior, such as spending a great deal of time at work. So they may work more hours or engage more heavily in sports, which sometimes is a good thing because you release endorphins. But these kind of things could be a sign of depression, you know, sort of the isolation and withdrawal that may be socially a little bit more accepted. Men often will have more physical kinds of symptoms like headaches or upset stomach, pain. And then men often will abuse substances more often than women. So if you see like an increase in alcohol or drug use, that's often a sign of mental health concerns for men more than women. Men express anger more easily and may express aggressive kinds of behavior, which are often inappropriate anger more frequently than women. Men engage in more risky behavior, such as reckless driving more so than women. And men will have often changes, some physical changes more than women, like changes in appetite, feeling more restless, having more difficulty with concentrating. Now, those could occur in women as well, but those are more characteristic of men. The typical signs of depression that we think about, which could occur with men and women, is the sadness feelings, that hopeless, helpless kind of sense, feeling empty, not getting pleasure from activities. That could occur in men and women, but those factors I mentioned are more characteristic of men. So you've touched on some of those factors that make men at risk for mental health issues. In summary here, what are some tips you have, whether it be for handling stress or otherwise, things men can do tangibly on their own to try to manage whatever may be causing mental strife? We all need to take a look at how could we reduce stress in our life? How do we manage this life work balance better and take care of ourselves? So we say take some time for yourself to carve out specific time. Could be listening to music, doing mindfulness activities, meditating, getting a massage. Sometimes that touch and the pressure into the muscles could be a wonderful release of stress. Eating balanced meals, eating healthier snacks. We know there's a brain-gut connection. Uh, what we take in could help us feel better. Limiting substances like alcohol or even caffeine. Sometimes both those substances could interfere with feeling well. Make sure we're getting enough sleep. The body, especially when it's stressed, needs no more sleep. I sound like a, a PCP, but exercise daily. Exercising releases endorphins. Endorphins are these natural, like opioid feel good substances in our brain that help taking deep breaths, getting more oxygen into our body, sometimes just slowing down, counting to 10 before you would react or respond to something. We know that when someone has a good sense of humor or enjoys laughing or that releases endorphins too. So try and engage in some activities that give pleasure with humor stay active, try and volunteer, look at your value system and do some things within your values as far as volunteering. Sometimes we'll say keep a journal just to write down what your day's like, what stressed you, and that could be helpful as well. We know that if people have people, they function better. So trying to prevent that isolation. So reach out to loved one. Loved one should stay in contact with someone to get help, contact a minister, a spiritual leader, your doctor, consider joining a group or a men's group it could be very helpful as far as preventing depression. And then there's a whole bunch of hotlines again. I mean, I, you know, if someone dials 988, it's a, a suicide and crisis lifeline. So instead of 999, someone could dial 998 and talk to someone. There's a disaster distressed hotline that's one 800 985-5990. And this line, you could talk about different mental health issues. If one's a veteran, there's a hotline for mental health. It's 1-800-273-8255. There's a phenomenal organization called the National Alliance of Mental Health. It's called NAMI, N-A-M-I. Tremendous resources for mental health in their 
800-950-6264. And then there's even some you know sites. There's something called Face It Foundation, which provides support resources for men with depression. There's an organization called Heads Up Guys. It's an organization that provides strategies to manage or prevent depression in men. So those are just some help groups that could be very valuable for men. Well, great advice, pertinent information. Thanks so much for those valuable phone numbers as well. Folks, we trust you're now more familiar with discussing and treating men's mental health. Dr. Stephen Prince, I feel less stressed already. Thanks so much again. Thank you, Joey. Great to be here with you guys. And again, great to have you with us. Now, for more information, please do visit Dooley Health and Care. Dot com As Dr. Prinz mentioned, they've got a great mental health team there to help you. Again, it's DooleyHealthAndCare.com. If you found this podcast helpful, please share it on your social media. And thanks again for listening to Dooley Noted, a health and care podcast. Hoping your health is good health. I'm Joey Wall.